Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Hope you all enjoyed uh, Charlie Boris Marty last week in my absence. Uh, we're thrilled today to have Brian Berkowitz with us from the, the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Before I introduce Brian, I want to thank again uh, Howard Weeder and the Canada Excellence Research Chair for underwriting Brian's visit and all the others. Uh, Brian is really a titan in the field of groundwater hydrology. Uh, he hails from Canada, so this is wonderful to have one of our own uh, back with us again, uh, where he did his uh, undergrad and uh, master's degrees, both at University of Alberta, before going off to the Israel Institute of Technology uh, for a PhD in the, the mid-80s. Uh, he's currently professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences and Energy Research at the Weizmann Institute and head of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at several universities, including UBC and uh, stints elsewhere. But I think it's really notable his impact on the field. He's, uh, after this uh, visit, he's heading to the Geological Society of America, where he's getting the uh, A.O. Meinzer Award. This is really the recognition in the field of hydrogeology. He also holds the M. King Hubbard Award from the National Groundwater Association. So one is more applied, one is more basic research, I guess, in groundwater and really he's been recognized by both societies. This is a huge thing and a very, very rare accomplishment in groundwater. Um, uh, Brian's also a fellow of the Geological Society of America and a fellow of the AGU. Uh, he's done tireless service to the community. He's been an editor of Water Resources Research, our flagship uh, journal, and he's been an editorial board member for Advances in Water Resources and, and Transport in Porous Media, and many, many other things. And it's a uh, terrific, uh, pleasure for us, and we're very fortunate, Brian, to have you have made the long journey. Uh, we're sorry it's, you're, you're here for our first real wintry week, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing about your uh, breakthroughs in groundwater. <coughs> uh, you're not supposed to clap before I've said anything. I can only disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be here, coming originally from Edmonton, and it's been 30-some years I've been in Israel, and in that time, I've lost my antifreeze. So there's no snow outside, but it's cold. It really is cold already. So I think I'll get right down to, to business here. As I say, I thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and it really is a pleasure to see what goes on here in Saskatoon. It's my, my first visit here. So going right away, I want to come up with an unusual kind of title, and we're used to thinking in terms of spatial concepts and not in terms of temporal concepts. And we think in terms of straight lines because it's most convenient. So before I get into hydrology and porous meat and everything else, I'd like to sort of play with your minds a little bit and keep this general. Uh, oh, actually, I should mention before that, the take-home message, especially for the students here, if you read this and understand this, you can leave afterwards, okay? You don't have to stay for the rest of the talk. But there are two main, main messages. The first one is that as I said before, the fastest path, not necessarily the shortest distance, but the fastest path from one point to the next is not necessarily a straight line, and I'll explain that. And we have what are known as preferential pathways in both partially saturated and, and fully saturated porous media, and what we end up with is what's called anomalous transport. In other words, it's not a nice circular behavior or a normal behavior. I'll explain exactly what I mean. But as a result of this, we have surprisingly fast early arrival times if we look at when contaminants will reach a, a control plane. And when I say not only surprisingly fast, often it's annoyingly fast, especially if you're a, a regulator and you say, I don't want the contamination to arrive so quickly. Uh, so it's surprisingly fast. And we also have annoyingly and surprisingly long delay times. So you're trying to remediate a polluted aquifer or a contaminated region. It can take lifetimes, much more than much more time than one would want. So let me go ahead now and talk about why the shortest path is not necessarily a straight line. This goes back to actually Bernoulli, 1697, and what's known as the brachistochrome, uh, brachistochrome uh, problem. So this is the curve of fastest descent, and it's the curve that would carry an idealized point-like body starting at rest, moving along the curve without friction under constant gravity. So just a picture, Galileo originally said, you want to move from point A to point B? Of course it's a straight line. Of course. Well, he then recalculated and got close, but he was off and realized that because of acceleration, actually if you have a downward descent and then this kind of a shape, you can arrive faster from point A to point B. 
he was wrong. The actual solution is what's called this Brachistochrone curve. And what's cute here, I found this just on the internet, start three points here, and look how much faster the blue curve arrives. Okay? So that's not intuitive by any means, and to prove exactly the path. Okay? So the fastest, the shortest time, not the, short, not the shortest length, but the shortest time, is in fact this kind of a curve. Okay? So throw away thinking in terms of space. Next one to play with your minds again a little bit. What's the difference if we average between time concepts and space concepts? Okay, we want to drive 100 kilometers. So suppose we say let's travel at 50 kilometers, travel the distance of 50 kilometers at one kilometer an hour, and then we'll travel 50 kilometers at 99 kilometers per hour. Okay, so what is my average speed in terms of the distance traveled? Well, I traveled one kilometer here in the first hour, I traveled 99 kilometers in the second hour, so my average speed was 50 kilometers per hour. Right, that's easy. How long did it take? It actually took me 50.5 hours. Okay, so if you're used to thinking in terms of just spatial averages, you say, oh, 50 kilometers an hour, so it was 50 kilometers. It actually took me 50 and a half hours. So this is, again, don't think always in terms of space. Time is, is, is key here. And this, this will, I'll show you some more examples as we go along where we've been, I think, barking up the wrong tree in many respects. So another concept is dealing with heterogeneity and averages. So what is the average hydraulic conductivity? So if I take a bunch of squares here, each element here has a different hydraulic conductivity. And for those who have done electrical engineering, you can think of these as resistances. So if you have resistances or conductivities in series, <coughs> excuse me, the hydraulic conductivity is given by the harmonic mean. Okay, that's standard. So what does that mean? <coughs> excuse me. If I have five blocks here of a porous medium, let's assume the hydraulic conductivity of each one of them is three. Okay, that's easy. Now let's look at another set of blocks. We have two of high hydraulic conductivity, uh, one of very low hydraulic conductivity, another two at six. What's the harmonic mean, the effective mean here? Well, just if you put in the arithmetic here, you come up with three. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Of course, it's three all the way along. What's the hydraulic conductivity here? It's the same thing. Okay? So what happens here is because, sure, the, the conductivity here is low, but these other ones on either side are high enough that it pushes through. So again, if you just think spatially, you'd say, oh, well, it's much easier for the water to move through here than through here. The water doesn't care. It's the same. So those are a couple of examples. One more danger of averaging I want to point out, and we've done a lot of work in visualization. So first of all, we always say, well, small-scale heterogeneities, we can just average them out. It doesn't matter at the larger scale. And there's always the famous example of the statistician whose head is in an oven and his feet are in a block of ice. And he says, well, on average, the temperature is fine. OK? So I thought that was an old one. I'm glad you left. Uh, <laughs> So just to do a simple image analysis. So let's take a fine sand here and a coarse sand here. You can see the different colors here, and you can see a clear distinction between the two. Now we're going to upscale. We're just going to do an average. So if I take an average in the camera and say, what's the average color? That's my average color. So if I now have replaced this domain by this and say, how, what does the water flow through in this system versus the water th flow through through this system? I think you'll agree they're going to be very different. That's the problem with averaging. So we have to be very careful at all times. So having set that up, we get to the next question, which is scale dependence or independence. People always say, gee, you do something at a very small scale. How does it translate to a much larger scale? So here I'm borrowing a set of four photographs from good friends of mine, uh, Scott Tyler and uh, Steve Wecraft. This was from some years ago when they were trying to show what fractals are all about. Now you would probably say, ah, well, with, with uh, uh, Adobe, with Photoshop, this is easy. But these are actual photographs. So here we have a nice photograph of a, of a porous medium, right, of an outcrop. And as a good geologist, you take a camera cover or a pen or whatever to show the, the size here. So here you see the outcrop, camera cover. And just to, prove, oops, just to prove the point here, so you see here Scott pointing to the camera cover. Go back to this picture. Now let's look at another outcrop. 
there's another outcrop, a little chunk of rock, and you see the nice camera cover there. No Photoshop, there's Scott. Okay, they actually went to the workshop and had a, a camera cover, a piece of cardboard made that size. What is the point here? If you look at this picture, and you look at this picture, even though you've got this camera cover here for scale, that and that look very similar. So there are some cases where if you develop a theory or experiments uh, that you want to look at for what you think is a very small scale, very often it does in fact translate to a much larger scale. Okay, so it's not always, and I've been accused of this in the past, say, oh, well, you're working on a tiny little column. I'll show you some experiments in a little bit. The same findings at this tiny column translate into the similar results at the field scale. So you don't have to discount one from the other. Okay. <clears throat> and then finally, for anybody who's never gone out into the field, and I admit, I only went out to the field after I finished my PhD in hydrology. Okay, the first time I saw a well was after I graduated. I'm embarrassed to admit that. So you go out to the field and you say, my gosh, look at this mess that we're dealing with. We always used to work with uh, what are called academic aquifers, right? It's a nice rectangular system with a homogeneous domain. And you look at a sand and gravel pit. This is from uh, Switzerland that was taken here. You can see the outcrop. This is a, a fractured carbonate from southern Israel. Some of the fractures here and the, the channels, you can stick your hand in them. They're so wide. You get down to micro cracks within the, the carbonate material here. So we have to deal with multi-scale heterogeneities. But it's not just this scale. Let's go down. And <coughs> excuse me, these were measurements done at the, uh, an aquifer in, uh, in the United States a number of years ago. This is from Lynn Geller's book. And these are measurements of porosity and permeability at 30 centimeter intervals. Actually, at the time, when they measured it, it was 12 inches. Okay, they were, they were still in the, uh, the American units. But what you, what's remarkable here is you look here, every 30 centimeters, look at the measurements, you have orders of magnitude changes, just going from 30 centimeter layers. Okay, so to talk about something being homogeneous, homogeneity exists in our minds, and nothing more than that. Now let's look, in fact, at X-ray images of a sandstone. And you look at a chunk of sandstone from this distance, it looks very homogeneous. Look at the scale here, half a millimeter. And from one, these are images of the pore spaces. Look at the variability just in the sandstone. So on one hand, we do need to average and we do need to upscale. On the other hand, we have to take into account that there's this huge variability at all scales. So it's kind of a, on one hand and on the other hand. And for those of you who don't know some of the history, there's a famous quotation from, from uh, Harry S. Truman when he was president of the United States. And he said he wanted an economic advisor with only one arm. And the reason is every time he asked for advice, the advice he said, well, on one hand you can do this, on the other hand you can do that. So we're stuck very much in the same, same kind of situation. So now let's look at pollutant transport. Okay, so here, what's the motivation here? And I don't think to this audience I need to spend so much time on it. The, we have everything from oil spills to contamination from industry, from landfills. Do I need to spend more time on this, Jeff? That's, that's all well known. Okay, so we don't have to uh, justify what we have to deal with here. And then we've got this classical advection dispersion equation. I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes, where we get these nice predictions of how plumes should move. And what an equation like this does not take into account are the early arrival times and the late arrival times. When we're looking at the spill, we're very often not so much concerned about where the average part of the plume is. We have to worry about when that first material starts to uh, reach a control plane or reach a groundwater system. So we have to be dealing with these kinds of tails. To drive the point home, oops, to drive the point home, when you look at drinking water standards, in North America and Europe, you're usually allowed up to four parts per billion of organics and heavy metals in water. Okay, take a glass of water, uh, more than four parts per billion, it's considered carcinogenic. Okay, it doesn't mean if you drink that glass of water, you'll die right away, but the toxicologists have said, probabilistically, this is what we're allowed. So the question always is, is four parts per billion, how serious is that? Well, it's the same as eight grains of sand in a ton of peanut butter, if you want to do a calculation. So now put on the table here a ton of crunchy peanut butter, put in nine grains of sand. If there's a carcinogen or heavy metal, you can't eat the peanut butter. So we don't have to worry about averages. That first small percentage that reaches the groundwater 
we have to deal with it. And I found this picture a long time ago, and it's still valid, and you say, well, 1%, 2%, 5% difference, how important do we have to worry about errors? There's some of you working in sensitivity analysis and risk analysis, and you say, well, 10% error is good enough. The difference in DNA patterning between this little guy and every one of us in the room here is less than 0.1%. So if you think about 5% error, we're making monkeys out of ourselves and worse. So keep that in mind as well. So then we get to reality. Uh, this is a, a field site, uh, the Bull and Fog, they published this some years ago. Uh, this is in California, and you can see here the scale of 400 meters by, what is this, about 800 meters here, different materials, a huge range in, in porosities and permeabilities, and when they did the numerical simulation through there, you get this ugly kind of fingered preferential uh, pattern. Okay? This is the reality that we deal with, not these nice uniform shapes. So, now let's go back to the laboratory to drive the point home a little bit more. Some years ago, I did some experiments, and this was about an 80 centimeter long flow cell with acid washed, ultra pure, ultra uniform sand. So, there's nothing patholo pathological about this, fully saturated. We tried to make it as homogeneous as is possible. So, a head gradient from one side to the other, uh, sealed on the top and the bottom. And just to show pictures here, we, insert, we injected here several plumes of dye. Now, according to the usual theory, if we had a nice pattern, this is what we're supposed to get. The uh, plume moves with the average velocity, and we'll get this nice, uniform, symmetrical spreading. This is what the theory tells us. And the theory is beautiful, the mathematics are wonderful, you get nice, uh, relatively simple solutions coming out. Let's see what you actually get. Well, when you look at the patterns here, I think you'll agree that, first of all, none of these plumes looks like any of the other ones, and none of them has this kind of a shape to it. And this is in a, quote, perfectly homogeneous domain. It doesn't get more homogeneous than that. That's at, at a very simple scale. We can go a step further. The same system, we pack this with little blocks of low conductivity sand. There's a factor, I think, of eight difference in permeability between the fine sand here and the coarse sand. You would expect, again, this kind of nice pattern. And what we see instead are these plumes and by the time we get down here, while the center of mass is up here, look at the long tail. There are bits of red dye left way behind here. This is the, and as I say, there's nothing pathological. These are very simple experiments to do. They just hadn't been done. So instead of the expected Fickian pattern, in other words, if I now integrate here and say, what's the concentration through here? I get this nice normal distribution. As I move, as I move uh, through time here, this is what the plume should look like where the center of mass of each of those plumes would be the average fluid velocity. Instead, what you get in this kind of a case is these kinds of curves. So the center of mass is, in fact, slower than the average fluid velocity, and we have these heavy tails. Material is, is held behind for a long time. This is the reality, and there's nothing, as I say, nothing pathological, and this is already a simplification of reality. So how are we going to model this? And I'll give a very brief introduction to what's called CTRW, Continuous Time Random Walk Modeling. It was developed over 45 years ago for electron hopping and amorphous silicon. And this is from the physics literature. It's a long story how I got into that with a close colleague of mine, Harvey Scher, who invented it, let's see, 40-some years ago. And we moved in the direction to adapt it to porous media. So I'll give a couple of pages with equations and, and, expla oops, and explanations here. So for the mathematicians in the audience, I, of course, have to look very impressive, right? Okay, here are the equations. Look how smart we are. To the people who don't understand, close your eyes for about three or four minutes, and then we'll come back to reality again afterwards, and I'll, I'll show some nice pictures. So just to give a little bit of a feel for, for what we're doing here, here's the conventional advection dispersion equation. <clears throat> so that's simply the change in concentration with time. And that reminds me to the non-mathematicians in the audience, because somebody once asked me this, well, can't you just cancel the Ds? OK? <laughs> and fortunately, I remembered something that someone had showed me a long time ago. I don't know if you can see this. If you take 16 over 64, you can actually cancel the sixes. And it works beautifully. <laughs> so we have to be careful. So it wasn't such a stupid question to ask about canceling the Ds, by the way. That's, uh, that's valid. 
Uh, anyway, so here's the advection, so here's the advective term, and here's the dispersive term, the standard equation. We'll work, we'll change this into the Laplace space just because of what I'll show in a few minutes. So if we take the Laplace transform, that's the Laplace transform. I'm not going to explain that right now. This is what the equation looks like in Laplace space. Okay, you can just take my word for it, it's very simple. So this is what we have the advection dispersion equation. Now what we're going to do instead is introduce, in the fastest I think I've ever done this, is continuous time random walks. Now we have what's known as the usual random walk approach, where you simply say, if a particle is sitting at point L prime, we want the probability that at step, at the, sorry, it's step N, the particle is found at L prime, what's the probability that at N plus one, it's found at location L? Okay, so it's simply take the summation of all the locations it could be, and what's the probability of hopping from L prime to L? You simply take the summation of all the probabilities, and that's the probability you've moved to the new point. If you do that for enough particles over enough time, over enough time steps or, or n steps, you'll get the standard transport or diffusion equation. Okay, you can show that. Einstein showed that in 1905, and it's very elegant. So what we do simply is say, here we have a counter, n, n plus 1, n plus 2. Instead, we have to ask or suggest and say, what happens now if there's a time penalty, not just how far the particle hops, but how long it takes to make that step. Okay, that was the, the innovation here. So we now expand and say now we're at location S prime, but at time T prime. And where we're hopping this, this uh, making the hop from L prime to L, or here we make the hop from S prime to S, we also have to make a hop in time from T prime to T. Okay, so the probability of just having arrived at, at uh, time step N plus one at this location is now replaced by this term, which is the probability of just arriving at location S at time t. So we have now an integral or a summation, whatever you like, both in space and in time. So what this allows us to do, to do and I'll show you in a, in a few moments here, you can have uh, contaminants that are moving along. Some will take a very long time to make a long hop. Some will take a very short time to make that same hop, depending on where they are. And similarly, you can have, well, if I go back to this, come to think of it, so here you can have particles that are held for a very, very long time that don't move. So we're allowing the full range of transitions. Okay, and without going into, I won't explain anything more, we can end up with a, an equation that looks like the advection dispersion equation. This is the form of the equation, and it looks the same as we had before, except we now have this memory term that multiplies everything. If we block out this memory term, get rid of the integral, we recover the advection dispersion equation. And we can in fact show that under very specific cases, we recover the advection dispersion equation from here. So it's not something out in left field, it follows naturally, it's a generalization of this equation. So the only thing I have to explain, the other piece of mathematics I have to explain then, is what goes in this memory function? This is now in the Laplace form, and so again, if this equation, if m is 1, we recover the advection dispersion equation. This memory function is given by this messy thing here, where the psi is simply the probability, the transitions in time that a particle takes. We don't have to worry about the distances. What affects things is the probability in time. And this is why I was emphasizing before, think in terms of time, not in terms of space. So we write a form here. This is empirical, but it works beautifully. It's what we call it a truncated or tempered power law. The reason it's truncated is that when we're in the range between time between T1 and T2, this power law term uh, uh, dominates the equation or dominates the form. When we're at much longer times, the exponential dominates the form. So what happens if you go to a very long time system and uh, you're now actually in this range, in this, in this exponential range here, everything drops out, the memory equation here, this actually becomes one, and we recover the advection dispersion equation. As long as we're in this power law regime, where we have uh, the, this uh, beta coming to a plate, when we're in this effect here, this is what's controlling the, uh, the long time behavior. So if we look at some simple column experiments from years ago, this is now looking at one minus the concentration, so the, the curve goes down instead of going up. Concentration is a function of time. Here are the measurements from a column experiment. Here's what the advection dispersion equation would predict with a very fast drop-off and this long-tailing effect 
we pick up with the CGRW. And I think in the interest of time, maybe I won't bore you with explaining the differences. But it's enough to say that the power law here, this beta term is given, uh, it governs the length or the, the influence of this algebraic tail. This T2 tells us when we go to Fickian or convenient behavior. And uh, everything else is normalization coefficients and gives us the average velocity. Okay, so I won't dwell further on that. So now let's get to the modeling and the interaction with theory. So these are some additional experiments we did some years ago. This is about a two and a half meters long. You can see here three different kinds of sand. And this was a, a, we were trying to mimic a geological formation. There was a known statistical distribution here of the, of the uh, form of the different lenses. We inject blue dye here just to, to give the image. And hopefully you can see here these kinds of fingering patterns that form as it moves through the domain. It's similar to the LeBole and Fogg simulation I showed before, these preferential pathways. We do not get a nice uniform pattern. So rather than getting something like this, uh, here are the breakthrough curves we got at different flow rates. And this is the fit and the prediction we get with the CTRW with this equation I showed before. We're able to pick up the behavior very, very well. Okay? And in fact, uh, while my son was, this was a number of years ago I was working on, he would have been about 12 then, I'm sitting on the sofa at home one day and watching TV and trying to do these fits. And he says, Dad, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, you see these, these curves here. I'm trying to, these points here, I'm trying to fit curves through these points. And at the age of 12, he says, well, why don't you just make the points bigger? And then I knew he was going to be a scientist. In fact, he's gone in that direction. Okay, so, so now, <clears throat> let's now generate some conductivity fields, okay? So here, we have here 300 elements by 120 elements. So imagine that behind this pattern here, we've got a grid. Okay, so there are 300 elements in this direction, 120 elements here. We'll generate, it doesn't matter how, you can get into various details of how you want to generate the statistics behind this, but this is supposed to be, in geological terms, a realistic conductivity field for a, a geological formation. We've got a fairly large variance of the hydraulic conductivity, so the log variance, uh, we work with log variance here on this scale, the variance is about five. Now the problem with most of the theories that were developed and most of the simulations that were done worked at a log uh, variance, uh, sorry, not a log, they looked at a variance of around one or one and a half or maybe two and said, wow, two is very heterogeneous. When you get to real systems, you have to deal with much higher variances. Okay? There's nothing, again, nothing pathological here. When you look at a pattern like this, this is the, the, simula this is the, the earlier experiments we've done. Here's a conductivity field. So, first of all, if we think spatially, and again, remember this is wrong, but if we think spatially, we'll use what's called critical path analysis. And so you want to look at what is going to be the main flow pattern, if I look from left to right, what will be the main flow field or the, the pathways that will go through this domain? So in critical path analysis, you start with the highest conductivities and then look at the next lower conductivities and you keep reducing the threshold until the system is just connected. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for the, the critical, the critical uh, value of conductivity here where if I go below it, sorry, if I'm above it, the system is not connected. If I go, go below it, I've just become connected. Okay, is that clear to everyone? So this is, this is called, again, a critical path analysis. And it's uh, related to what's called percolation theory, if you've heard of that. So here the system is just connected from one side to the other based on the highest conductivities. Okay, now remember what I said before about the harmonic mean, and we get a different result? <clears throat> so if you would assume everything moves through the highest conductivities, that's the pattern we should get. I'll digress for a moment and point out again also the importance of time as opposed to looking at space. Here's a conductivity field that was generated numerically. And what you see here through here, these, these horizontal curves are the flow lines through the domain. Okay, so I fit a, a specific, uh, 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 what do you call it, gradient, hydraulic gradient from one side to the other, solve for Darcy flow. These white lines here, those are the flow lines. If I now increase the gradient by a factor of five or a factor of 10, what happens to the flow lines? The answer is nothing. You still have the same flow lines. Everything simply scales li linearly. Everything moves faster through the domain. So the flow problem is trivial. 
What happens if I'm now dealing with contaminant transport? If I have a very low gradient, well, things move along here, but they have a long time to diffuse into these lower permeability regions. If I now increase the gradient by a factor of 10, the transport is much faster through here, and so the, the contaminant moving through here is not going to feel these low conductivity zones. So the transport problem is very different from the flow problem because it's a function also of the resonance time in the domain. Right? If, there, if it was pure diffusion, everything would be filled here, the entire domain. If it's a faster flow, you sample less and less of that domain. So what we did <coughs> excuse me, is we now take this conductivity field, we solve for the flow pattern, get this kind of a pattern through it, and now we put 50,000 particles through here and see how they flow through the domain and say what comes out the other side, called a breakthrough curve. So for three different conductivity fields, so we have increasing variance. Uh, we have three different curves here, three different breakthrough curves. Uh, this is at the outlet, and this is halfway through the domain. So it's sufficient simply to concentrate on here. So what do we see? Well, first of all, as the variance increases, as the domain becomes much more heterogeneous, it takes longer for the last particles to exit the domain. Okay, remember, this is a log scale, too. Okay, so if it's very homogeneous, everything moves through in a nice cloud. As it becomes increasingly heterogeneous, we have an increasing tail. And in CTRW terms, when I fit that truncated power law form to it, the beta value, that exponent for how anomalous the transport is, decreases, which is what we expect. When beta approaches 2, you get a very fast drop-off. Beta of 2 gives you the advection dispersion equation. So again, everything uh, converges to that. If we look at what the average velocity would be, if we had uh, tried to fit it with the advection dispersion equation, uh, you would get a value, just a moment, so this, yes, if we tried to fit with the advection dispersion equation, you would get artificially a value of 3.4. The average fluid velocity is, in fact, almost double, much higher. So what this means is, again, particles are moving through, but they're getting trapped. So the average velocity of the plume is slower than the average fluid velocity which is sort of, again, an unusual, somewhat unusual concept. So we'll keep this in mind. So these are fits, but everything is consistent. And you, you see, I hope that I convince you that we're able to pick up these breakthrough curves very nicely with the same uh, modeling uh, approach. So here was the conductivity field. Now let's see what the particles actually interrogated in the domain. Well. What you see here, in fact, is of the particles that enter the system here, this is the pattern. The red colors, the higher colors, are more particles. This is a log scale. This is the number of particles entering in each cell in the domain. Blue means very, very few particles. White means these are areas particles never interrogated. They never saw the domain. So in other words, everything in this region up here, the, part, the, the hydraulic conductivity here could have been even lower the particles don't care. They never see what's in that region. Now, that's kind of upsetting to people, <coughs> excuse me, because the idea supposedly is that the longer you wait as particles move through the domain, everything will homogenize. You'll see all the domain being, being interrogated by particles. And in fact, that does not happen. So here's the, the behavior. And again, it's similar, in fact, to what we saw empirically from these experiments, that again, you get bypassing. Here is material moving through. And this whole region here and this whole region here is never touched, is never seen. We'll go one step further and say, of all these domains, all these pathways where particles uh, enter the domain, let's now remove those uh, regions where there were less than 0.1% of the particles. Okay, going back to that monkey picture I showed before. So we say, if less than 0.1% of the particles injected in th into the domain uh, 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 are, are, uh, are visiting these uh, regions, we ignore them. So 99.9% .9 of all of the contaminant that moved through the domain moved through these very small number of channels. Okay? Think again. Had you seen that, and if I'd asked you just visually where do 99.9% .9 of the particles go, you would have probably said, oh, you have a nice smooth cloud. That's the reality. Until you solve for it, you've got no way of knowing that. 
Going back then, this was what I showed before, the critical path analysis. If you only take the highest conductivities and, and cycle down to say the system is just connected. If we subtract from this the pathways here where particles actually interrogated, what we end up with is this cloud of regions. So all of these sections here are below the threshold. These are low conductivity zones that if you looked at it visually, you'd say, oh, well, that's a low conductivity. We can ignore it. It's not part of the flow patterns. Because of this harmonic mean kind of behavior, in fact, these are critical regions, low conductivity regions, where flow, 99.9% .9 of the particles move through them. Okay? Again, so this is counterintuitive. And anytime people talk about the critical path analysis, it's beautiful. The theory is wonderful. The physicists and other hydrologists have had a lot of fun with this for a long time. It's irrelevant here. Okay. So what we do further, and I should probably move ahead, OK, uh, is we want to then uh, relate this to the, to the continuous time round and walk and say can, we say, can we say something more here? So here is simply the frequency of the conductivities. The, these are the open circles. So in other words, if I do a histogram of this system here, and I say, what is the distribution of conductivities? I get these open circles. If I say, what is the distribution of conductivities where particles actually visited the domain? Okay, and these are, so these are the conductivities I'm interested in. What I end up with is this, these black squares. And all of these frequencies here, all of these, sorry, the frequency of all these conductivities, all of these are the ones below the critical path threshold. So I won't go into the math that we did or the arithmetic we did afterwards. We converted this into times. We say in each, in each of those elements where the particles are found, what are the times? And when we generate that, what we end up with is this cloud of gray points. So this is simply a frequency or the probability of uh, sorry, the frequency, I should say, of different times as particles move through that domain. What we find here, if we, take that, if we take that power law that I had before from these fits here and use the same parameters, what I get is this black curve here. So in other words, we're able to see a very nice fit or match between the weighted time distribution in the, in the different elements versus this fit. And so we now have an exact relationship that links the statistics of the conductivity field to our exponent beta. Okay, so that exponent, it's not just coming out of nowhere. This is the, the key parameter. We're able to, to actually determine where exactly it comes from. So there are a lot of words here. Very quickly, again, just to stress the point. So in terms of the origin of anomalous transport, we know that CTRW is able to describe this very well. And we now have a direct relationship that connects the CTRW parameters to measurable uh, parameters based on the hydraulic conductivity field. Again, you can't look only at the structure of the system. You have to solve a flow problem or a transport problem through it. It's misleading just to say, give me the conductivity structure and I know everything. Simply wrong to do that. Uh, I should actually skip over all of this. I made the point before about the uh, critical path analysis not being applicable. And the one other point, again, I want to make, we talk about the advection dispersion equation, say, if we wait a long enough time, I'll go back to this, if we wait a long enough time, we should go to Ficke and transport. Okay, everything should be solved by, or described by the advection dispersion equation. And that's true. That'll happen. If we wait long enough, where were my curves? If we wait long enough, I'll have a drop off here that I can describe by the advection dispersion. But that doesn't mean that I've sampled the entire domain. What's actually happened is all the particles that I entered here end up exiting the domain through just a small number of channels, but the velocity distribution in that small number of channels is narrow. And so what I end up with is what looks like a Fickian behavior. Okay? But as I say, it's not that we've homogenized. The textbooks are wrong. They say, wait long enough and you sample the whole domain. It doesn't happen. So that's kind of fun. It's nice to be able to say we were wrong. OK, so let me move ahead then. So those are the, the main conclusions I wanted in that part. OK, so bef until now, we've talked only about a, a, a uh, completely saturated domains, fully saturated domains. So what happens now under partially saturated media? And I mentioned to Jeff earlier, I don't like using the term unsaturated media. 
because it's never unsaturated. You always have some residual water. So let's refer to it as partially saturated domains as opposed to uh, unsaturated. So uh, certainly the group here has been very involved in these kinds of questions. The question is, you know, where, when it rains, when you have irrigation, where actually does the water go? And there's all these surface runoff and stream flow issues. I'm not going to deal with that at all. I recognize the importance, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I want to look, about, uh, look at the infiltration to groundwater. Now, I swear, before we started talking about this today, I had this slide in from a long time ago already. This is from the group, and this is beautiful, because I'd been doing some work looking at what we call old new water, and fortuitously came across this paper. I won't go into the details, because you're supposed to know this, as long as you've been exposed to Jeff's group here. But the idea is that you have different kinds of water in the domain. You can have mobile water, you can have preferential flows, you can have trapped water. So the ground outside is not this nice homogeneous sponge where the roots just go in and, and take water from a, a nicely mixed region. We have different regions where the roots will go and where the water is available. So uh, what I want to look at again is you have an infiltration problem. So when water, when you have rainfall or irrigation, water starts to move through the porous medium. Where actually does the water go? And the question is, is for example, if it's partially saturated, do you have piston flow? Does the new water coming in simply displace the old water? Does it bypass it? Does it mix? What really happens? And this is a question I asked my PhD advisor. I'm going back to 1982, 1983, I asked this question. And he says, well, we don't know. At least he was honest, okay? I appreciate the fact that he was honest. We don't know. Have to think about it. I started going through all the textbooks, and nobody touches this. It's just, you have rainfall, the water table rises. Okay, and this, this Vado zone is some black box. So basically you have, and I'll use the term new water and old water, you, so in an infiltration event you have new water, that's the fresh water coming into the domain, and whatever is left behind is our old water. So now we want to try and understand new water, old water, what is the interaction, and of course chemically they can be very, very different, and we want to look at the interplay. So we can't avoid looking at two different processes. One is infiltration and one is drainage. And what's the difference here? In infiltration, water is advancing into the air phase, which is different from then water displacing, uh, sorry, air displacing the water in the drainage phase. And why is it different? Well, if you're infiltrating water, the smallest pores will be the first ones to fill up in an imbibition problem, for example, right? You put, say, uh, different capillary tubes, if you've ever done the experiment, different straws of di different diameters, say in water, the narrowest ones will fill the first because of, uh, of capillary rise. But if you're now draining, it's the smallest pore next that will be the last ones to drain. Okay, so you don't have, it's not a reciprocal event. It's not the first to fill or the first to drain. It's the first to fill or the last to drain. Okay, so we have to deal with that. So the question then is in an infiltration vent, how does this new water connect to the old clusters? <coughs> Excuse me, what does it displace? What does it not? And how much water actually leaves the domain? So pictorially, if my blue is the, uh, is the air, uh, just a moment, let me get this right. Blue is the air phase, here's my old water, here are the sand grains. If I now infiltrate water, well, one possibility is here I've got the fresh water coming in and simply displaces everything. Okay, that would be easy. Just pushes through. Another possibility is you've got, well, partial mixing. You have, say, trapped water here. The fresh water moves through. It starts to pull off bits and pieces, and you have some kind of mixing. Third possibility, if the fluid flow is, is slow enough and there's enough uh, exchange or enough time for exchange, there can be diffusive transfer either of the water molecules and or if they're different chemicals. If I have here a pesticide moving through and I had fresh water before, there will be exchange of the chemicals. And a fourth possibility, not shown here, is simply it bypasses, simply goes around. And the last sort of piece of empirical evidence here is a series of experiments that were done uh, going back by uh, Marcus Fleury and company in 1994, looking at if you have soil that's initially wet or initially dry, and then you have an infiltration event, what are the different patterns? What do they look like? So maybe I'll just focus on these ones. So here are two soils that were initially dry, and then uh, water was infiltrated in them. And this is what the infiltration patterns look like in the dry and the wet. And if you have initially wet conditions, this is what the infiltration pattern looks like. 
So in other words, initially wet means that there were more clusters of the old water. So when new water comes through, we get a uh, higher or deeper advance of the water. Okay, this is completely empirical, but it indicates there's a difference between how much water was left in the system, and we get different patterns. So to try to model it, or try to explain this further, I'll skip, okay, I'll mention this briefly too. Uh, there have been a few field tests too, which are probably more difficult to do in the lab work, which is why I don't do it. Uh, but there's uh, some lovely experiments here, for example, maybe I'll just focus on this one, uh, a catchment area, I think this one is about 1,200 square meters, and so uh, um, water with bromide was uh, infiltrated and then allowed to drain out, and then new water was infiltrated in with a rainfall simulator. And what they found uh, is that of the uh, outflow, so here's the amount of outflow, the uh, volume per, uh, sorry, the, the amount of outflow as measured by the bromide concentration, and here in fact is the amount of new water that came out. Okay, so again, just to, to explain, you have different chemical signatures. You have water with bromide in it. You water, it goes into the, uh, into the ground and some of it drains out and we let that remain. So now I've got water pockets with bromide. Now you inject fresh water. If you had a pure piston flow, the rest of the bromide would be washed out. We don't find that. We find of all the water, here's the difference between the actual amount of outflow water and the amount of uh, fresh water, or the, sorry, the new water that came in. So obviously this difference is the amount of old water. So we did a series of experiments with a micro model. So here's a blow up of the micro model, the dimensions eight and a half centimeters by 12 centimeters. <clears throat> so you can see here we're, we're at the micron size. We've got very, very small pores. And this is about as homogeneous as you can get. Again, this is with glass etching, which is no longer done because it's considered too dangerous. But it looks very homogeneous. If you do a blow up of that, there's small variations in those pores. To give you an idea of the kinds of, kinds of pictures we can get, so here we'll inject uh, uh, red dye first into the system and then allow it to drain out, and we get this kind of a picture. So here are my old clusters of water, clusters of old water. Now we inject blue dye, and you see different mixing patterns going through there. And I don't know if you can see as you continue to inject the blue dye we get regions of purple. Purple is where the blue and red mixed. Where it stays blue, the water simply bypassed. So I think I have a better picture here to show that. Okay, this is again also showing the differences. Here we had the red dye that was in the system. So we inject red dye, allow it to drain out. Then we inject the blue dye. If we do it very slowly, look at the pattern it takes here. It's certainly not the shortest distance, okay? but it's the shortest time to get from here to here. So this is the pattern that it took, and you can see here we've got huge regions of the old water that remain untouched. This was with a slow invasion, with a much faster invasion, you get different kinds of patterns. So again, the resonance time and the rate of, of, uh, of infiltration is critical. So then we look at three successive cycles. So we have three different dyes here. I only show here the first two, the blue and the yellow. So first we inject the blue dye, allow it to drain out, and we're left with these pockets of blue, okay? Then inject the yellow, and uh, again, from flows from left to right, inject the yellow, and what do you see here? Again, this is simply bypassed, okay? It doesn't care about the blue, about the old water that was there. In other cases, you can see here, this is the start, the yellow is reaching the blue dye and will in fact push it out. And if you do a blow up, we can find regions here of green. Why do we want yellow and blue? Well, when you mix the two, you get green, okay? So the green tells us exactly where there was not displacement, but mixing between the old water and the new water. So you can do all the statistics on that and, and blow this up, do many different experiments, and then count. Uh, this is why you need graduate students, right? Because somebody has to count all of these little squares and say, how many are yellow and how many are green? So that's, that's why my student got the PhD on this one. And you can look here again at these kinds of patterns, and I think for the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip over this, but the idea is if you focus on a certain point, you can see with time, the evolution, which regions get displaced, which ones show mixing. Again, we gather statistics, and what you find, the percentage here is what the initial water content is, so how much old water was in the system. And you find you have around 4.5% old water. Initially, here's the most of the old water is washed out very quickly, and then we reach a plateau. 
but still after this cycle, roughly 10% of the initial old water remains in the system. So we do this at different initial water contents, and in every case we find this two-step behavior. When we have these old water clusters, initially the first infiltration vent, most of the old water is washed out, and then there's a very slow additional bleeding out of that old water. But in all cases, you have as much as from 10 to as much as 25% of the old water remaining in the system, which, at least initially, I thought that was rather surprising that so much should remain behind. I'll skip all that. We did a various, bunch of, a various set of column experiments then. We moved from this micro model up to 20, 30 centimeter columns, different kinds of sands, water contents, flow rates. We ended up with the same behavior. Two-step behavior that it drops very quickly, and then we have a remainder. In some cases, though, we still have here 20, 30 percent of the old water remains behind. So you say, okay, well, we get this to the micro model stage, we get this to the column stage. What happens to the field? Going back to those experiments I mentioned before. So, in both a uh, rainfall uh, event that was that was simulated at, 40, at 14 centimeters depth in a large block of soil. And in an enclosed catchment, this was, I think, as I said before, I think 1,200 square meters, you find similar types of behavior. Very fast drainage initially, and then what remains behind. In this experiment, 5-10%. In this experiment, as much as 30% of the old water remained in the system. So maybe this is beginner's luck. Maybe this is something more general. But we went from a very, very small scale to a much larger scale. And in every case, it's the same kind of dynamics two-step behavior, and as they say, in some cases, 20-30% of the old water remains in the system. So then if you think about, gee, I'm trying to remediate something, just flushing it out a couple of times, if, you've left, if you're left with even 5% or even 1% of that radioactive or organic or other, otherwise toxic material, remember that monkey picture, 1% left in the water is still carcinogenic, or still not acceptable. So I'll just end then, it's probably a good time to end. So it's always a question when we look at all these problems, do we know what we're looking for? Okay, think in terms of time, not in terms of space, that's one message. Think in terms of variability, small scale to large scale, and I always like this picture just to keep in mind that we know what we're looking for. So with that I'll end, and I'll be very happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, thanks, Brian. Questions? Yes, Jim. Just one quick question. In your micro model, yep. so you get water on the system, you have to get new water, new water, new water. Is, is there any way to compare it like in the context of flow volume? How much flow volume do you have to put through the system to remove, say, 95% of that half of the remaining flow? Uh, We didn't do it in terms of pore volumes. Um, no, actually, in this case, you can see, just a moment, this is in terms of the normalized time. I'm just trying to remember. It was several pore volumes that went through, and it remained. I'd have to back calculate. I honestly don't remember offhand, but it, it stays. Do we, uh, I don't think we gave it in terms of, no, just in terms of the times, but it, it stays. You can't get rid of it. This is uh, like the sting in the fractal tail. Yes. Jim Kirshner published yeah. a paper in 2000 in Nature looking at fractal mm -hmm. uh, transit time distributions of chloride data from, from uh, Plinlimon. And I remember a commentary that Mark Stiglitz wrote that mm -hmm. accompanied the paper. Yes, and it was exactly, the sting yes. in the fractal tail. Right. I guess that's, that's this in a way. That, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, that long tailing, in fact, we went back and looked at those, those kinds of data, and you find with CTRW, we can explain that long. Yeah. That long behavior. Interesting. Looking at students in class. Yeah. If you come back and come back to the long tail, the gradual tail and the same thing where it's just getting to the field of water, then is that not a good thing? Like, what is the problem? Because I guess you're, you're testing, uh, you're taking a contaminant map and putting it in the system and you're testing it. It depends. If you're the Ministry of Health or the Ministry you, of the Environment you, and you've got 5% trapped and it's going to remain there. Every time you have an infiltration event, a few parts per billion are going to be released. That four parts per billion puts you above the, or five parts per billion puts you above the standard. 
And that's the difficulty, that it, if you could get most, if, if you didn't have that drinking water standard or if you could get 99.9% .9 out, you'd be okay. But that's, that's... Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but the difficulty now is what's happening with the health authorities. We used to have the, the, the uh, drinking water standards used to be PPM because that's what you could measure. Then we got gas chromatographs to go to the PPB level, so they lower the standards. We've now got LCMS, where you can go back to the PPT level. And now they're considering lowering this, or raising the standards again to have drinking water at, at the PPT level, which is ludicrous, but okay. I think at the back, Andrew, and we're gonna try and use the microphone. I should have done that with the first one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <coughs> uh, yeah, so you've shown us convincingly that this phenomenon is happening, but can you just, do we know why it is happening? So, for example, in your micro model, why are we getting this trapped old water? Randomness. <laughs> okay. Again, if you do a blow up here, you'll find very, very small variations in the channels. Okay. Not every, nothing is perfectly, nothing is perfect. Okay. You always have some randomness here. So I showed before also those, those, uh, those uh, X-ray uh, images of the pore space at the half a millimeter scale, right? And you saw huge variation within what looks to be uniform. So we have small scale variation. So the moment you have small scale variation, whenever you have any front moving through, so we have this, this blue material trapped, why should you expect, let me ask the question the other way around, why should you expect a nice uniform movement through there? The moment that you have a slight breakthrough here, okay, there's a, there's a, 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 a nanometer size uh, uh, increase in the radius here as opposed to here, so it starts to break through. Once it starts to break through, you have a positive feedback effect. It, it loops, right? So once it started to move through here, it's easier to continue to move in this direction than to start somewhere else. So then you get to these areas, and, it, you, and again, it's purely random. Is it going to go in the direction of hitting the blue, or will it go in the other direction? It's randomness. Hold on, hold on, Bing. Hold on, Bing. We'll get you a microphone. <laughs> and Saman will get his exercise. Yeah. Thanks. So if you repeated the experiment at an identical condition, flow velocity and water content, would you get the same pattern again? Or the pattern going to change randomly? If I repeat this experiment, I'll get at the outlet the same behavior. I'll get here the same behavior, but I won't get the same exact pattern. Again, because it's random each time, I'll get slightly different shapes, but the overall effect of, of how much mixed versus how much uh, remained unmixed, that tends to stay pretty much the same. Does that answer? So in other words, at the, out, at the outlet, yes, it's constant, it's reproducible, but any specific pattern, of course, will be different. If I got a smaller column versus a larger column, mm -hmm. um, then the output would be different because of this uh, randomness. Not no, the normalized output, not necessarily. Here, as I say, you, as I said before, you know, you can have 10, 20, 30 percent remaining after several pore volumes or after a long time. This was <coughs> the micro model scale. We did the same thing in these 20 centimeter columns, different flow rates and whatever else. At a much larger scale, we get the same kind of behavior. Okay. Uh, actually, you asked before about variability. This shows that uh, actually more honestly. Then these are three different experiments, and you can see here there's variability, but pretty close. Here it's much closer. Here it's amazingly close. Here you can see the variation. Okay. Which is why I was told many years ago either do one experiment or do a hundred. Right? If you do one, then you can get a perfect match. If you do 100, you get such a spray of points there, you can draw anything through it. But this is with three. Okay, a separate question is, how do you know this is a water? The, uh, this is due to the water because of the old and new water or because of the chemical properties? For example, if I use chloride, chloride cannot get very close to soil surface. Mm -hmm because of the anion ex exclusion. Right. So I guess, how do you know it is the older water or it's due to the uh, chemical itself? 
Well, all we know is if you do a first saturation, say with the chlorinated water, and then the next event is with the pure water, then how close the chloride got to the, to the pore walls of the clusters, I don't really care. I have no way of measuring that. But I do know how much then washes out afterwards. So it would really be, and I think that at the molecular level, what you're looking at here is if the chloride is stuck here in the center or a little bit further to the close, or a little bit further away from the wall, if there's a repulsive force, it doesn't really matter. It's within that cluster. But the way I know for sure that it was old water as opposed to new is because there are different chemical signatures. So there's no question that it was coming from the old water cluster. But where within it exactly, I agree, I don't know. Okay. We're actually planning some, some other experiments where we're going to precipitate out uh, material, and then we can see exactly where material was trapped. That's a different story. So what does this say about percolation theory then? This is almost like a percolation physical yeah. model. Percolation theory is a wonderful theory. I did a lot of early work on it uh, 20 years ago. Uh, there are two problems with percolation. Well, this is, okay, there are a couple of problems with percolation theory. One is it gives you scaling behavior, which is very useful to say, well, s something will scale to a certain power. That's useful. But it always scales out. So it doesn't give you the coefficient of proportionality. So what do I do with it afterwards? I still have to do the experiments for any given system to know what the proportionality coefficient will be. That's the first problem. Second problem, this takes us to something called invasion percolation because you're dealing with two-phase flows. Okay, so invasion percolation, I actually have a picture here, oh, it doesn't matter right now. Uh, invasion percolation is another game or a sort of toy model where you can scan a domain and allow particles or uh, uh, material to infiltrate. And so you can pick up uh, you can pick up, say, air going into water or uh, oil going into water, those kinds of immiscible flows. You can pick that up very nicely with, with invasion percolation, but again, only the power law. It won't give you the, exp with the uh, coefficient of proportionality. And in the saturated case, just quickly again, I said before, I, I'm, I was hitting on critical path analysis. That comes from percolation theory. Mm -hmm. In the fully saturated case, it's simply wrong mm -hmm. or not relevant. Good. Well, I'm, I'm uh, conscious of time. We've just gone five minutes over. I think we'll, we'll draw it to a close here. Um, Brian is with us tomorrow. We're not going to Alexander's tonight, but he'll be with us all day tomorrow. And if you want some time with Brian, send me an email or see me after the talk and we can uh, arrange a time if you want to connect. But Brian, thank you very much. You've My given pleasure. us so much to think about. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you again. <laughs>